Good morning and welcome to the Tuesday, December 12th, 2023, regular closed session meeting of the EdMed Board of Directors. Roll call, Madam Secretary. Okay. Director Chan. Present. Director Coleman. Present. Director Linney. Here. Director McIntosh. Here. Director Patterson. Present. Director Young. I'm here. President Katz. Present. President Tim McGowan will now open the special closed session meeting of the Retirement Board and take roll call. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, this special meeting of the Retirement Board is called for the purpose of conducting a joint closed session with EB Mudd Board of Directors regarding existing litigation pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9A in the matter of Coleman versus EB Mudd et al. And with that, I'll have uh, Lisa uh, Sarani give us a roll call. Thank you. <clears throat> Director Chan? Present. Director Young? Here. Clifford Chan? Present. Tim McGowan? Here. Jay Park? Present. And Elizabeth Corsetti will not be in attendance. And I'll turn the meeting back over to President Cotts. Thank you, President McGowan. We move now to public comment. If members of the public are online and wish to speak on agenda or non-agenda items, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. Comments on non-agenda items will be heard now and comments on agenda items will be heard when the item is up for consideration, which is also at this time. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, we'll, we'll take public comments uh, from speaker cards in the room. Uh, do you have any speakers in the room? I have one speaker card in the room, and that is Yvette Rivera. Ms. Rivera, please come up to speak. You have three minutes. And I have one hand online that just um, came up, so I'll call that person after Yvette Rivera. Your three minutes start now. Thank you for this time. All of the board members received the resignation letter of a person that works in David Briggs's group. That's the same group that Derry Moten uh, skewed some data, removed some data so that that group wouldn't look bad when it came to reporting DIO efforts. I just heard a speech from Mr. Moten about how the district is doing. And I really think that this board should look at how many people have quit since July 1st. You would be shocked. You would be shocked. And look to see how many people of color. Because you're looking at data that shows, oh, women are being hired, people of color are being hired. Look at who is quitting. Do you think that they're going to be brave enough, brave enough, like that administrative secretary that really blew the lid off of what was happening in there? Yes. They're allegations, yes. But sounds like some of it is pretty similar to the crap that I've been going through. The stuff that Mr. Director Coleman's wife has been talking about. But no, we're gonna hear Direct General Manager Clifford Chan saying, oh, we're gonna investigate. How many times do you have to have people come up here and say the same thing? Well, April, Director April Chan, you weren't here when a gentleman by the name of Ross Spinner came to, the, came to the board meeting. He was amazing, he was brave. And I've had a little interaction with him since. I showed him that letter. He couldn't believe it. Well, maybe he could believe it. He said, thank you, Ivy, for sending me this. I'm afraid it will take the top to change. And it sounds to me like the bullies keep getting hired in management positions. He also goes on to say, that he did have a Microsoft Teams meeting with Clifford and Derry. I believe this happened after the first board meeting I spoke at. I do remember them saying they were going to start exit interviews of employees to leave, who leave for any reason. They did have an HR person give me an exit interview about one month after I left. I was hoping to get a commitment to assign an equivalent experienced employee to advocate and mentor new employees, new hires, to help prevent harassment and abuse. They would not commit to this because by saying, they would not commit to this by saying new hires on probation can talk to anybody, especially their supervisors. What a freaking joke. 
I don't know what this board has the power or thinks they have the power to do. I know you have way more power. We even have a Mr. Martinez come in from Contra Costa who worked here who said, you have a lot more power than you think because he knows it. Please do something to change what's happening. I have been speaking at this board meeting since December 10th, 2013. Nothing has changed. And I am going to provide for Director April Chan the brave videos of Ross Spinner speaking. And it was for nothing. I yield. That quick question, if I may. Um, when did Ross uh, ha um, have supposed to have the team's meeting? What year? With, um, I actually have the, uh, I actually have the, he said one month after he spoke, and it says here that he spoke on, uh, I think it looks like May 2021, but I'll, I'll look at my records, I'm going to post it on, I already have his first talk on video on YouTube mm -hmm. under I, I Rivera, and you can just hear his first speech, I still have to post his second speech. Can you send it to at I least sure me? I sure can. Thank you. And following up on a comment that Yvette made, this goes to Derry. Since July 1st, how many people have quit? And, and their ethnicity, et, what ethnic? Uh, they, ethnicity. Es, my tongue is tied. <laughs> I need more coffee. Ethnicity. Are they? So do you know that now? Okay, can you get that to us, not by for the next meeting that we have, but by a memo? Yes. Thank you. Can, can we include it in your other request you had at the last committee meeting? I want it before. No, can we include it as part oh, of yeah, the Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Clifford. So when are we supposed to get it by? Uh, when are we supposed to get it by? Derry, how long will it take you to put the information together? Um, we should be able to pull that data and have it for you for next week. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rivera, for your comment. The next speaker, are there any other speakers in the room, Madam Secretary? No other speakers in the room. We have, you're on Zoom, we have Lana Coleman. It's the next yes, speaker. Uh, Lana Coleman uh, will be called for, for speaking. I do want to address a request uh, that uh, was addressed to me regarding the amount of speaker time. Um, we will be uh, sticking to our normal three minutes uh, for each speaker. Um, however, we, we do have an opportunity to speak on matters uh, on the agenda in addition to matters that are not on the agenda. Uh, so I, I, will, I will recognize uh, Mrs. Coleman for uh, both matters. Um, if, if you are speaking on matters that are on the agenda, please limit that um, content to three minutes. And if you're speaking on matters that are not on the agenda, uh, then that um, shall be limited to three minutes. Um, and, and collectively, that, that may take uh, more than three minutes, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we certainly will expect uh, uh, somewhere in the range of, of uh, uh, no more than six minutes at this time. Okay. Lana Coleman, you should be able to unmute your mic, and your first three minutes will start now. Is this non-agenda or agenda item? It's an agenda. Okay. It's an agenda item. Okay. I, your three I, minutes start now. I apologize for the, the bad feedback there. Um, I don't know that you're going to be able to understand me. Let's go. Um, you can go ahead and continue to speak. Okay, I'm trying to see, see what I could adjust on my end because it's very Im important to be heard. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Lana, do you have the live stream and Zoom going at the same time? Do you have the live stream from ebmud.com playing as well? I have what I've always signed into. Lana, do you have the live stream and Zoom going at the same time? Do you have the live stream from ebmud.com playing as well? Can you hear me at all? I have what? I can I, hear I, you. I, Mrs. Coleman, you, you clearly do have the live stream going. I would ask you to turn that device off or mute it, and that way the, we will not have uh, feedback. So we'd be glad to hear your comment after that. I, I'm sorry. What I did is clicked on the Zoom 
Ms. Coleman, you, you clearly do have the live stream going. I would ask you to turn that device off or mute it. I'm sorry. I don't know what live. I don't know what live stream is to turn it off. Okay. And you are not on a phone and a laptop. You're just on one device. That is correct. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know what live. I don't know what live stream is to turn it off. Are you watching the proceedings on a laptop? Are you watching the video yes. on the laptop? Okay. Can you yes. turn that off? That's that why you're getting the feedback. Okay. Won't I lose the connection? No. If you so, if you have a video on, do you have two devices or one device? I have one device. And the Zoom shows me. That's why you're getting the feedback. The Zoom shows me the meeting in progress. If I turn this off, I'm turning off Zoom. So if you have a video on, do you have two devices? One. I have one device. Can you close your? Do you have two browsers open? Zoom shows on your phone. I turn this off. I have Word open and Zoom open because I need to read my document. Okay. President Katz, how do you want to proceed? Because we're going to continue to receive, unless we're in the room, I don't know why the feedback is happening. Yeah, Mrs. Coleman, I would urge you to find uh, whatever is uh, streaming the meeting and turn that off or else we will not be able to understand you as well. Um, I, I will begin your time. We've given you this courtesy for technical support, uh, but we're not able to correct it for you. What about um, just calling in? Whatever it is, uh, could I, yeah. Could I try that? What what phone number do I call? I'll turn my computer off. I, I will begin. Your Give me time. one moment. Area code five one zero. No, it's not a five one zero area code. Give me. Oh, one okay. I'm turning my phone back on. I don't know if that will cause any. Okay, the, the phone number to call into the Zoom meeting is 669-900-9001. Uh -huh. And hopefully you have the webinar ID and um, you should have the webinar ID there with you. Do you have that? No, no, ma'am, I don't. I just have the Zoom screen and Word. Okay, the webinar ID is 970-6508. I'm sorry, 970-6508. Okay. Six 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 seven. Six six seven are the last three. Six 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 seven. Three sixes. Okay, I'll do it right now. I apologize. I I have no idea why. Mrs. Coleman, before you uh, leave, uh, let me get make sure you have the passcode in case that's yes. requested of you. Okay. Two three eight. Three sixes. Okay, I'll do it right now. I apologize. Five zero zero. Thank you. Mrs. Coleman, before you uh, leave, uh, let me get, make sure you have the passcode in case yeah. that's... All right. There are no other hands for um, public comment in there. No other public comments in the room. We'll wait for the call to come in. Can you look for the, we should be looking for a phone number. Nothing yet. There we go.
Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Lana Coleman. Ms. Coleman, you may try pushing star nine to unmute. Okay, we see you now. Can you hear me? Yes. And your three minutes start yeah. now. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for your patience, all of you. I, I'm very sorry for that. If your worker fails to turn off a valve properly because it's different from any valve they've seen, unintentionally letting water flow from your pipes into a homeowner's yard it runs into the house, causes a mess, the walls are near collapse from excessive damage, what will happen? The worker will be reprimanded for negligence and the district will assume financial liability for the damage. If an HR worker and their manager fail to interpret the complex retirement ordinance properly, there's a retiree situation unlike any they've ever seen. Incorrect information is unintentionally provided to the beneficiary and the beneficiary makes irreversible financial decisions based on it. But three years later, the error is discovered damaging the beneficiary's figurative, fi figurative financial house until it collapses from extensive harm. What will happen? The HR manager will get raises and bonuses. Because the damage is not tangible, like it is when a house floods, the district will deny they made a mistake, cause damage, or have liability. Employees watch and trust the district less. All parties lose. Five years ago, two retirement experts stated clearly and directly to me that a state salary would be used to calculate retirement benefits in determining my retirement income. That is the honest to God truth, so help me God. Based solely on the formula provided, I retired early and bought a home, a retirement home, incurring higher mortgage debt. When the mistake was discovered three years later, it was too late. In my early 60s, I made irreversible financial decisions. I will be paying for the district's error for the rest of my life. Additionally, I was denied due process. The court document filed by the district states the retirement board decided not to pay the promised amount. You all know that's not true. I should have been referred to the retirement board. I didn't know it, I, but I should have been. But instead was told, the district is finished discussing this with you. Your only recourse is a lawsuit. This denied the due process provided for the ordinance itself. You my, have situation 30 seconds. Is the same. my situation is the same as if a water leak destroyed my home. My financial security and stability is my house that was destroyed. It is not reasonable to expect me to go off in the sunset overlooking your liability for destroying my house. There must be accountability from the board, even though you aren't the ones who made the mistake. We all know that. I know you step up and are financially accountable when a building or road is destroyed. This should be no different. You're tired of hearing from me, but this is a matter of such consequence that I will not rest until the di district demonstrates accountability. Thank you. Thank you. The three Thank minutes you, have Coleman. concluded. And I don't see any further public comment. There are no further hands. There are no other hands for public comment. Okay. Seeing no further public comment. Uh, the EdMed Board and the Retirement Board will now convene to conference room eight. The EdMed Board is scheduled to return for the regular meeting at 1.15 p.m. Welcome to the Tuesday, December 12th, 2023, regular business meeting of the EBMUD Board of Directors. We will receive reports from this morning's planning and legislative human resources committees under item 16. Roll call, Madam Secretary. Director Chan. Present. Director Coleman. Present. Director McIntosh. Here. Director Lenny. Here. Director Patterson. Here. Director Young. Here. President Katz. Here. To uh, ensure that we have a, an ease of flow in the meeting's proceedings, I will now turn the meeting over to Vice President Lisa McIntosh, who will chair the remainder of the regular business meeting. Vice President McIntosh. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, oh, Pledge of Allegiance. 
<laughs> Please join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Uh, there are no announcements uh, required from closed session. Uh, we move on to public comment. Uh, if members of the public are online and wish to speak on agenda or non-agenda items, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. Comments on non-agenda items will be heard now. Comments on agenda items will be heard when the item is up for consideration. Madam Secretary, are there any public comments? I don't have a hand for public comment online, but I do see a phone number that was in the meeting last time, so I will ask that um, guest if they have public comment. Phone number ending in 1204. You should be able to unmute your phone. Hello? You should be able to hear me now? Yes. Do you have comment on an agenda or non-agenda item? Non-agenda item. Okay. Vice President McIntosh, you want to take that now? All right. Uh, I thought I saw a card. There, one card did just come in. Let's do um, the card for public comment here okay. in the audience first. Okay. You're not ready? Okay. All right. Then let's go to our online uh, speaker on a non-agenda item. And um, Ms. Coleman, you have three minutes. And the secretary will uh, keep the allotted time. And your three minutes start now. My statement was already prepared, but it's actually appropriate as follow up to the HR committee meeting I listened to this morning. There was discussion about whether employees are afraid to speak up if they have an issue. Unfortunately, this little story about my experience yesterday won't reassure them. There's no reason they should be reassured that I can see. I plan to share some hypothetical retirement scenarios with you prepared by Cindy Saran. While she covered reciprocity fundamentals several meetings ago, the scenarios she, pre she prepared afterwards document how reciprocity works in terms of dollars and cents when there's overlapping service. But my electronic version of this document, originally requested by John, had been copied or I think scanned and was of poor legibility. I sent Risa the blurry copy and indicated she could get a clean copy from Cindy, but that didn't happen. So I sent Cindy my blurry copy and asked her directly to provide a clean copy, but she refused, saying it was confidential information for John. She told me to request it via the public records process through which she knows a confidential item would not be provided. I wrote and asked who was directing her not to send it as I would be glad, glad to contact that person myself. No response. I think it was at that point I copied Clifford so he would know what was going on just in case he wanted to intercede with a reasonable solution. No luck there. I wrote Cindy asking if John called her, would she provide it? No response. Then John wrote to Cindy politely asking her to send it, stating that he waived any right to privacy. No response. He also asked Risa to display it as I had requested. Risa replied again that she could not display it since I was attending by Zoom. At some point I also asked who I needed to talk to to get permission. He did not answer that question, but only repeated that it could not be displayed on the screen. So Cindy didn't provide a clear copy for me to share. Risa still declined to share it on screen. My take is that these two are, are nice people being directed by others not to be nice. So lots of effort by the district to make it a difficult process for me. I'm not sure if the effort was to prevent the information from being shared or to just make it difficult me, for me. But I'm here minus the printed document that I would be unable to project. Whoever orchestrated this behind the scenes is wasting time, which is wasting district money. If this is the way employees are treated, shame on all seven directors for not setting higher standards and holding your managers accountable. One scenario Cindy documented was pretty much John's situation. You have five seconds. 
That's good. Okay. I'm just speaking too slowly. I just get it all in. Thank you, Mrs. Coleman. We have one speaker here in the audience. Are you ready yet, Ms. Rivera? <clears throat> And this is a non-agenda item, correct? Okay. Your mic is not on. Give me one moment. I need to pass out the documents that you provided. It is a non-agenda item. And then when, um, the employee feedback. All right. That some board members received this morning, this morning and others didn't. Uh, Take part. Yes, the mic is on. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Barely heard it. Your mic is on. Okay, thank you. So I provided uh, board committee members a couple of documents this morning. One was my appraisal comments, where I line out the retaliatory actions against me by Mr. David Briggs. This performance appraisal comment includes the union's uh, opposition to the retaliatory warning letter that I received. I spoke this morning about how Cindy Sharon, the HR manager, never stepped in to ensure that that letter was rescinded. So I, I also talked about how I felt Ms. Sharon and Mr. Moten really weren't the best fit for our DEI, DIO and our HR uh, management uh, positions. I say this because I've been coming to the board since 2013. Now it's been 10 years. The district and the unions obviously know I know how to protect myself. I at least know how to stand up for myself. But I really want board members to think about how many people can't. How many people don't have the experience that I had working at a state agency and then working at City of uh, Los Angeles, County of Sac, County of Sacramento, and the UC system. How many people don't have that experience to know what are legitimate HR practices? But I do. And Apparently, I also know how to file a civil rights lawsuit all by myself. But I want you to think about all those people that can. And I want you to look back at that data that Mr. Director Coleman just asked for today. How many people resigned or, or were let go starting in July of this year? Because that data wasn't presented to you today. And I also talked about Mr. Uh, Ross Spinner a really brave gentleman that was going to retire, and how he came to the board and said how he was tortured during his probationary period. And then he actually emailed me this afternoon and, or this morning and told me how Clifford Chan and Derry Moten did a Zoom call with him. And he tried to get them to have probationary employees have like a mentor or somebody who could advocate for them. But of course, that never happened. And I also talked about a resignation letter that all of you have. I'm not going to name the names in the, in the resignation letter. I don't have to. You're going to hear Local 21 say, oh, you know, it's unfounded. The I got to tell you, I have been subjected to Local 21 supervisor and senior management employment tactics. They're horrible. And it goes unbridled when you have people in power that don't have any guts. So I hope that after this presentation that I hear today about employee feedback, that this board takes really the, the reins of this organization and does something about what's happening. Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Um, that concludes public comment on non-agenda items. <clears throat> So let's move on to uh, agenda items. Madam Secretary, is there anyone online?
who wants to speak with regards to an agenda item? There are no hands on online All for right. public comment. We'll move on to the consent calendar. We are removing from the consent calendar item number eight. Um, are there any board members who would like to remove an item from consent? Excuse yeah. me, Madam Vice President, excuse me. I don't recall if you announced anything from closed session. We went No, I said there were no announcements. No announcements, thank session. you. Okay. Yes. I would like to pull um, item number 12. Item 12, Director Shannon. All right. And I'd like to pull, I'm trying to, six, eight, and 13. Oh, you just, you're doing that just because No, I should. Oh. Of course I'm doing it because you're sitting Six, there. Six, eight, and 13. Six, eight, 10, and 13. I'm sorry. They'll be quick. I'm going to get you for that. Thank okay. you. Um, do we have a motion for the rest of the consent calendar items? I'll move. Yeah, whatever those numbers are. I'll so one, item one, two, three, four, five, seven. 9, 11, which includes 11.1 and 11.2. I heard a motion, Marguerite? I'm seconding, yeah. Okay, all right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Roll call. Aye. Aye. We have to roll do a roll, roll call, call vote. Okay. Yeah. Roll call, Madam Secretary. Okay. Director Chan? Yes. Director Coleman? Yes. Director Lenny? Yes. Director Patterson? Yes. Director Young? Yes. President Katz? Yes. Vice President McIntosh. Yes. All right. So that gets us to item number six, the okay. consent calendar. Yeah, I'm trying to go to it right now here. It's um, a pretty quick question, I believe. Um, sorry, it's not paid, not on my... Okay. Um, I just want to make sure on item six, since we really didn't have a chance to go into a depth on this, um, that the uh, for anybody who is part of the uh, Infotech Research Group that about diversity, equity, and inclusion, that um, there is confidential. Uh, never mind. Six. I I'll, I'll move six. I made a mistake on six. I apologize. All right. Is there a motion? Second on six. I'll second. All right. Uh, item number eight. This was on the. We need to vote. Oh, we need a roll call. roll call. Yes. Yeah. Director Chan. Yes. Director Coleman. Yes. Director Lenny. Yes. Director Patterson. Yes. Director Young. Yes. President Katz. Yes. Vice President McIntosh. Yes. All right. Item number eight was on the Ledge HR uh, committee agenda this morning, and we did not have time to hear it. Um, what's the pleasure of the group? Would you like to hear the presentation that we didn't hear this morning? Or would you simply like to vote on it? What's the nature of the polling item? It's a budget item for... Uh, yeah, it's the employee feedback program. It's on the employee feedback program. We do have a public comment on it, and I think, Director Coleman, you had a question on this? I did. But April just said that she would like to hear it. All right. Director Chin would like to hear the presentation, so okay. let's do it. Well, we have Laura Salangsang here to provide the presentation. Right now. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me back. Good afternoon. This is item number eight. So, um, I'm going to go over um, the employee feedback program for you and. Um, Okay, so I will cover um, a, a vision of our culture, um, why feedback is necessary, the district's employee feedback history, the objectives and methodology of the program, the feedback cycle, our next steps, and your feedback is what I am interested in as well. We're going to start off first with the three core drivers um, of all organizations. Really, if you think of this as a, a stool with three legs, um, to have sustainable performance, to have the ability to put energy, resources, and priorities into strategy, design, and culture is 
ideally what all organizations um, would do for sustainable performance. And more specifically, when we talk about culture, we mean people and people's experience, the employee experience, based on the district values, um, our leadership, human resources systems, and the focus of today really is the stories employees tell based on the experiences they have. So when we talk about the employee experience, we're talking really about the district's culture. So what do we want our culture to be? What is that vision of our culture? An example of that vision would be directly from um, a, dis, a, de, a definition of inclusive culture that you can see in the DEI strategic plan, which is that every employee is intentional in creating and maintaining a work environment where all have a sense of belonging, purpose, value, and voice, and are engaged in, successful, in the successful fulfillment of the district's mission. So that, that's our vision, right, of, of what we want our culture to be. And as that relates to employee feedback, we feel that employee feedback is, is a necessary ingredient towards getting to that, that vision of that culture because employee feedback will allow us to foster employee engagement, improve our retention rates, boost overall organizational performance. Um, it, it's a way to gauge job satisfaction, to enhance organizational communication to identify issues in the workplace, to be able to have decision making based on data, um, to provide, um, to, to have an, a way to improve our organizational culture and to enhance leadership effectiveness, uh, boost employee well being, and support the growth and development of our employees. <clears throat> now, I, I, I wanted to share these statistics to further emphasize the necessity for employee feedback. Um, Zipia is a company that is a career resource um, um, organization. And they have, a, they have helped many um, people in finding their careers. They have helped many companies in, in attracting um, and, and hiring employees. And they also have done a lot of survey work on um, that what, what makes a, a workplace the best place to work at. And of that data, it was interesting to find um, this, these directly related with feedback, that employees who feel their voice is heard are 4.6 time, times more likely to perform their best work. Um, meaning, if, if they're heard and if they're engaged, they can perform better. Um, and it's interesting that additionally in the statistics that they've, they've accumulated, those who are actively disengaged um, and the relationship between employee feedback, you'll see specifically there at the top that having no feedback has been found with 40% of those employees who are actively disengaged. And even the benefits of feedback, that really has a positive in, in, um, impact on employee performance because 85% of those employees um, show to take more initiative, 73% show they have better collaboration, and 48% care more about their work. Now, the district is, is not new to an, an starting an, a feedback process. It's something that um, we've tried um, at least um, two times since 2014. One was through the Schnur um, Consulting Group, this, this um, type of feedback process with a lot of it would had to do with focus groups and things like that, which led to the district values. Um, it also led to the values advocates program, also led to the state of the district. Um, the other um, feedback and endeavor we, the district did was in 2021, and that was through the Winters group when we did the cultural audit. And that led to the creation of the the DEISP, which is a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan, equity core teams, updating the diversity committee, and even launching um, two new affinity groups. Um, so, so those were the results of some past um, efforts with um, employee feedback. Additionally, there we go. 
We also have other um, avenues in which we collect feedback. We, as, as we talked about earlier, we have exit interviews and, and surveys. We also utilize a leadership 360 assessment, and this is provided through a class we have called Meeting Leadership Challenges. And more recently, we have had many focus group discussions covering um, employee career mobility. Now, the objective of this program, it is to capture the voice of district employees regarding subjects or issues that most impact employee engagement and their work culture. It's also a, a way to prioritize items that best that, that present the best opportunity for the advancement of the district's mission, as well as those that pose the most significant threats to the ability to, um, to have to fulfill the mission in a sustainable way. And more importantly, it, it helps with, with action planning and, and how we do we incorporate that feedback. And, and how we do this, let's talk about methodology. So those items you see there, the new employee or onboarding survey, the biannual um, engagement or workplace climate survey, pulse surveys, exit surveys, and that leadership 360 assessment, those are, those are instruments that are um, created to provide employees opportunities to give feedback. If you think about it, 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 it aligns very nicely with, with the employee life cycle, giving multiple ways and methods of, of where an employee can provide um, their feedback and give them voice. And then data from all of those feedback methods can be used to identify opportunities for improvements. And speaking of um, improvement, let's talk about overall the improvement cycle. This is just a, a high level view of, of how this of how employee feedback data would, would help us for process improvement. So phase one would be where we would collect the data and analyze it. Phase two would be able to take that data to help us identify opportunities to further enhance existing programs or initiatives or to develop new ones. And the third phase would actually be to implement those new or enhanced programs or initiatives and then go out and survey the employees again to see how those new programs or initiatives performed. So if we would have this continuous process um, feedback cycle. So in regards to timeline, um, this for the biennial survey, and this is just one component of the overall um, feedback program, it, year one would be starting now through um, November of next year, and it would um, involve a pre-launch, a launch, and a post-launch. And the pre-launch activities would be the design and development of the survey itself and, um, and having communications with all employees and, and all stakeholders so that they understand the survey and they understand the purpose behind it. The launch activities would, would simply be to deploy the, the actual biennial survey, as well as any other pulse surveys. The, the post-launch activities is where we would collect and analyze the data and share results, as well as recommended actions. So our big ask of you is to um, consider this um, employee feedback program um, for, for, your, for your agreement and for your authorization. But at this time, I'm very interested in the questions you have. Um, go ahead, April. Go. go. Oh, okay. So um, I was looking at the how and how you're approaching this. I was wondering, um, are these surveys anonymous or yes. all of them? Because I know that there's exit interviews and entry interviews that can't be anonymous. Um, well, specifically... Um, the biennial survey and the uh, pulse surveys, those are anonymous. Um, there's, there, the way it's built in the system, um, it's, it's, it's anonymous through um, the reporting of it. Like data of, of, a, of an individual person will never show up in a report. It'll always be shown up as, as part of a, a group of employees. So, so it, it, their identity isn't sh doesn't show up in the report, but it is known it is not known um, at all at, for whoever's reading the report except because by so, the group 
I mean, only, yeah, you, you can see the data aggregated in, by different groups of people. Like if you want to see all female employees or all male employees or or um, people who were hired um, for a certain time period, you could see different clusters of, of um, feedback based on those drivers, not necessarily driven by individual. Okay, so at no time the individual submits their name. There's no, right? Because well, we're talking anonymous and that's what anonymous is. The, the only thing that, that is um, where they give their name is on those exit surveys. They only give their name if they want to be contacted for an interview. Okay, yeah. so since I've, um, I, I've arrived here, there has been some talk about a climate of fear of people not wanting to speak out um, if they feel that something might be wrong. And I was just wondering if your surveys address that in any way. Well, um, let's, let's be very specific about the biennial survey or the exit survey. What, what well, okay. Both. All right, both. Um, so with the exit survey, going off the top of my head, um, there are um, questions related to work climate and, and, you know, related to their experience. So there's also a space for comments in there. So if they do have a specific concern, um, then they, they articulate it there. So it's collected there. So it's it's... I don't know if I'm answering your question. So if, if they felt like they had an experience that needs to be followed through with, um, that where they felt like there, you know, someone needs to do something about what I, what I experienced, they're able to provide comment in that exit survey. And that's really process-wise, that's how we follow up with them hmm. in general. Now, the, the big biennial survey that we haven't launched yet, um, there are questions that has to do with um, five drivers. So there's engagement, there's experience and expectations, there's intent to stay, there's inclusion, and there's well-being. So within those drivers, any one of those questions, I don't have it on me, um, it, it can identify if a, if a person, let's just say inclusion, if they felt like they weren't being in, inclus, included, if they didn't feel like um, that they didn't belong, there would be questions addressing that. Mm -hmm. So, do you rely on people to write things in the comments, or do you just ask them outright? There are actual um, questions to ask them about their experience, and I don't, I didn't memorize right, the I questions, but yeah, there right. are questions that relate to their experience asking them. Okay. Thank you. April asked my question. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Yvette Rivera had comments after the presentation. Thank you. Director Chan, um, I think you came in the beginning of January. <laughs> I think you've seen a lot of stuff happen at the district since your arrival. Everybody else has uh, kind of, I think, seen some of the scenarios here regurgitated every year. Um, one of the, in, a couple of important documents that Ms. Salang Sang uh, referred to would provide you an enormous amount of information. One of them is the Sure Report assessing values to sustain performance. Um, a lot of employees were very candid. And that report, which I want a copy of, even though it says it's confidential, I was able to get the other report because reports are public documents. So I want a copy of that report. But you really should look at that report because I had many employees call me and say, they were a part of that committee, that they voiced, it was, a uniform group that voiced all of their concern. They threw everything on the table, and they truly believed in this consultant's in this consultant's work. They really thought the district was going to do something, and then this guy wasn't brought back. Let's move on to the other report. Same thing. I know I provided you a copy, but I'm not sure if the district or if the board has it in their 
I guess, in their scope, to bring these two consultants back and to have a talk with them without having the filter of general counsel's office or the general manager. You do not need to spend, to waste money, completely waste money on another survey for two reasons. One, you have a lot of the valuable information from all of the employees that couldn't stand working at this place anymore and quit. There were a lot of them. Now, as you can tell from the report this morning, we have a lot of new employees. And of, of course, all of us that are new are going to have a different opinion or a different outlook, unless they're being harassed and retaliated against. But that's why I'm telling you, spending money on another report, when you have two incredibly valuable reports to look at, it would be money better spent. I want to just end this by telling you that that woman that resigned, one of the items that she talked about was taking on responsibilities beyond her pay grade, but refusing to apply the work, how she was asked to run reports and analyze tr trends. This happens. Local 21, there are some local 21 managers, supervisors that take credit for the work of AFSCME employees. I did want to just end by saying, you're going to see signs about integrity and, you know, it's the propaganda. Those came out of the SURE report. But those were goals. That wasn't the state of the district. And for everybody at the district that has to suffer through the indignity of being treated like crap, Your three minutes those signs concluded. are painful to look at. Thank you, Yvette. I yield. All right. Oh, I just have a question on the board. Is there... There may be value at the Ledge HR committee, at minimum, bringing the two companies back to talk candidly with the, the Ledge HR committee or the entire board. I mean, we get spoon-fed a lot of stuff. I know that. Everybody knows that. So sometimes we don't, aren't able to answer the question that needs to be, can't ask the question because we're not giving the information. I would, and I personally Lisa, you have chaired the committee. I would think there's value at least going to the ledge committee with the two uh, entities that produce the reports and talking to them um, before we sign on a contract. This is this contract is is um, prospectively with the WEN source group. Yes. So are you asking that they come before us to answer questions? Um, trying to be clear on your request. Uh, they and the SURE, I guess, is the other one. That was done in 2018, I think. That's what I thought I heard. That's not part of this contract. No, I mean, no, we, but cer it's, we certainly can. It's related to what Ms. Rivera said, though. Well, perhaps we can just have a copy of that, right? That's one option, or we can ask, maybe we get the copies and then we can ask questions. I just would like to see the entire reports, I guess, so we can compare apples to apples on this. Um, I'm not trying to frustrate the board. It's just a legitimate question. No, it's, it's fine, John. Um, I'm just trying to determine where to put it. Um, so what I suggest, and let me know if if the rest of the board agrees. I suggest, um, is this time sensitive, first of all? I, I think just looking at Laura's nodding head, I would say yes. I mean, again, th this is about going forward and continuing to get feedback from the employees. Mm -hmm. um, we can certainly share the Schnur and Winters report with the board to see you know, at, at those times what the feedback from the employees, but I think it's always important to continue to get feedback from employees. Sure. Um, Marguerite? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 to me, it seems like it's a both and kind of uh, issue that we have is that, is that the information that we got in the, um, the SURE report and um, what I assume was the Winters Group report gave us information about that time, which is now what? For almost four years since the winter's mm -hmm. um, report that 
if we're getting ongoing, and this is about getting ongoing feedback, um, which I think is critical to understanding and measuring progress. And, and um, seems like it <coughs> makes total sense to use the SURE information and the Winters information and anything else we have from the past to um, you know, create metrics and understand you know, where we're making progress and where we're falling, you know, where we're still falling behind or falling short. So that, that, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem like they're in competition with each other. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, if it... Give me a motion. I'm ready to move the item. I'll second. Okay. Well, are we going to get the information? Yeah. All right. We need so, an number one... What's the May we have all of the information, both reports. I can provide both reports to you. Okay. Okay. In full. In full. Um, and then let's address the motion. We have a motion and a second. Do we need a roll call vote? A roll call vote? <coughs> yes. Okay. Director Chan? Yes. Director Coleman? Yes. Director Linney? Yes. Director Patterson? Yes. Director Young? Yes. President Katz? Yes. Vice President McIntosh? Yes. All right. So we have a two prong. We'll get the reports and we've moved the item. And just so I'm clear, I will send those reports to the board to review. If there's further discussion, let me know. All right. Okay. That moves us to item number 10. Yeah, 10. I'm going to support this. What I want to do is an update. Um, I know we're going to send more trench spoils to Keller Canyon Landfill. Um, how much discussion, I know one time, Clifford, you talked with San Francisco Bay Development Commission, BCDC, but how much discussion has taken place with SFEI, the Corps of Engineers, and BCDC about using the trench spoils, which are clean, for, uh, water sh for uh, climate change enhancements, because there's a, there's a demand for that purpose on wetland production in the San Francisco Bay. There's not enough material to protect not only for climate change, but for shoreline resiliency and creating wetlands for the habitat as well. So how much of we're we going to be looking at sending for that purpose? So we're, we're doing, um, we had updated earlier this year, the number of pilots were focus on. We're going to provide an update next year to first with the planning committee on the various options. We have started or, recent, or will start soon a direct haul pilot. Um, so we'll provide an update to the board on all the various pilots that we're looking at and other options we're looking at. This particular contract is about taking um, materials to Keller Canyon that is not hazardous but may still have some level of contamination. So, so it can have contamination, but not cross the threshold of being a hazardous material, which are two different things. So this, is, a, this is about bringing materials to Keller Canyon, which I don't think you'd want to place in some of those other locations. No, clearly if it's contaminated, you don't want to be putting it in your water. I completely understand that. Yeah. But I can't, I would be surprised if a lot of it, maybe I'm wrong, would be contaminated. It's coming from the ground. It's been protected by pavement, in most cases, over it for years. And a lot of it's rock, sand, and gravel. Yeah, so, so again, we'll, we'll provide an update to the planning committee um, on the progress on the various options that we're looking at to dispose of our trench saws. And when is that, Clifford? I think it's scheduled for um, middle of next year. That's what we had told the planning committee earlier. Okay, but you've been working um, with some of these municipalities for a while, so... We've been working on a number of options. I don't think we've made any progress on municipalities changing their um, their code to allow to put trench walls back in the trench, um, because that's the only thing that uh, we could do. But we're looking at other places to dispose of the material, the clean material. And just to be clear, these soils are not the same soil. These are this is. The soils we've been having to dispose of all along, it doesn't go to Briones, it doesn't go to, um, uh, I'm blanking on the other site, that Miller. We, this Miller site. Um, these are, th those are the clean, the clean soils that we then look for uh, beneficial uh, use for 
unless we have, end up having to off haul them. Correct. Correct. So your report will include the beneficial, the clean soils going for beneficial use? Yeah, yes. Whole... Yes. Okay. All right, John, do we have a motion? I'll move it. Is there a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Madam Secretary, roll call. Director Chan? Yes. Director Coleman? Yes. Director Lenny? Yes. Director Patterson? Yes. Director Young? Yes. President Katz? Yes. Vice President McIntosh? Yes. That moves us to item number 12, which is to authorize the Office of the General Counsel to continue the employment of the law firm of Myers Nave for specialized legal services uh, related to labor and employment matters. Okay, and so an amount not to exceed 100000 Okay, so I pulled this item. Um, I don't have a problem with the amount of $100,000, and for the purposes, I'm just continually concerned about our increasing liability connected to this firm. And, um, I don't think I can justify <laughs> voting for this uh, to my constituents or anyone else or to myself. So I would be a no on this. Can I ask you, I'm not sure I heard you right, our increasing liability to the firm? No. Is that what you said? That involves the firm. I'm sorry, could you explain that just a little better? Increasing liability? Yeah, I'm, I'm well, I'm talking about um, the lawsuit. That, because I, I'm talking about the interest that's accrued every day um, that we haven't paid. And so this, um, and that's why I'm saying I'm concerned about every day. It's a lot of money. And I don't know how much I want to go into this on, in public session. This, this, funds, this contract is for the array of services that um, Myers Nave provides. I, I understand. I understand. But nonetheless, we are holding a lot of liability um, and with the services connected to this firm. And I can't justify if someone asked me, and one of my constituents asked me why I uh, voted for more money, I couldn't justify it. So I'm just going to be no. It's a trust issue. Just it's mind. just going to be no for right. me. Um, Yvette, you didn't sign up for this. so. Um, you have East Bay Mud meeting minutes, misrepresentation and whistleblower comments. Yes, but um, Eric Larson spoke this morning, giving them a card, and he would like to ask him a question. If I can't, I will respect your choice. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I appreciate April Chan stepping in. Myers Nav was actually the law firm that has been used for years um, to oppose or to represent the district on at least, I'd say, five PERB complaints that I filed and many PERB complaints that AFSCME has filed. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, cases were about retaliation. I've spoken before about how East Bay Mud is like the Catholic Church that protects its pedophiles. They hire attorneys and they protect the people that are doing the wrong and the people that profit are the attorneys. I am super proud that there's at least one board member that will stand up and say maybe this is a questionable thing and I appreciate it. I wish I would. I wish I lived in your district. Thank you. I yield. All right. Do we have a motion? I move approval. We have a motion and a second, Madam Secretary. A roll call. Director Chan. No. Director Coleman. No. Director Lenny. Yes. Director Patterson. Yes. Director Young. Yes. President Katz? Yes. Vice President McIntosh? Yes. I'd like to just ask a question on six and we know it's been passed. I'm sorry. If we're done with, I, there's one question.
question I meant to ask on item six, even though I voted for it. Oh. So I couldn't find it and was flipping through. We're not going back to item no, six. No, I'm not going to say that we're going to vote on it. I just want people to catch what I caught this weekend. On item six, I was sort of surprised since this is on uh, the issue of D E I. And I don't know if you looked at the contractor's workforce profile. Percent of employees for men is 58.1, yet the MSA market is 39%. Percent of white women, it's uh, 26.3. Yet the MSA market is 33.7. Ethnic minorities, percent of the workforce at McLennan is 15.6. But the MSA labor market is 27.3. I just find it a little bit ironic. And I'm sorry I couldn't find it when I was trying to flip through that um, we're hiring somebody who doesn't meet our own goal goals. We hired somebody. We already voted on it. Okay. We are aware of that. That moves us to item number 13, authorize the amendments in the restated district 401A, 401K, and 457B tax deferred savings plan documents. And did I pull that? I pulled that. You pulled it, yeah. Um, I just want guarantees that when this is being rolled out, I want to know who did the final review, and hopefully there are no mistakes in it, so that a future employee who enters into our 401k program does not see something here that is going to be later said, oh, sorry, we made a mistake, and they end up being financially harmed. So who reviewed it, and is it going to be guaranteed that there's no mistakes? Maybe we can start with who reviewed it. We have Lisa Serrani here that can answer that. I think the guarantee question is a different question. Hello, uh, thank you, board. So this is a joint uh, work with um, uh, outside counsel that we use, who we try to annually take our, let me state with this, our plan documents here at East Bay Mud are um, very detailed. Many, there's a lot of pages in here. I there's see a that. lot of pages, yeah. So many places I've worked not in public sector, uh, their 401k plans, they use like a model plan document, which is, uh, you know, five or six pages, and you check and say, are we going to give a match, or are we going to do in-plan distributions? And, and they're very easy to update. The IRS authorizes them all the time. Here, we have um, very robust plan documents, and so we take them to council each year. Um, many of the changes that happen in plans are related to IRS regulations. And so, um, and then often those IRS regulations uh, are required to be implemented right away, and then time is given to be able to update plan documents. So, uh, in the last few years, there's been several big um, IRS-related um, updates to plans. Some of the things that come through in both the SECURE Act and SECURE Act 2.0 are mandatory, and then many are voluntary. So first, we take the items related to the SECURE Act and the SECURE.2 Act to our Deferred Compensation Advisory Committees. So we have committees that include management and union representatives, and we talk to them about the mandatory items, and we talk through the um, optional items and make decisions about what the committee feels should be included in our plans of the optional items. So we have those discussions with committees first, and we uh, then sit down with uh, legal counsel, let them know. This is internal counsel. Um, uh, Lord As Matthews helps us with these plan documents. So we review with her all of the changes. We keep an Excel spreadsheet about all of the things that were elected. But then we send that out to legal counsel for them to both confirm that we that there's nothing else we've missed that's mandatory, um, and then confirm that they've added the language related to the optional items that we've created. 
The other thing that can happen is as we move through our day-to-day -day administration, sometimes we catch that there are not things in our plan that are needed for our administration. So uh, our ability to manage those committees sometimes requires somebody to fill in for a member on management, so we added some language for that. There are corrections that sometimes have to be made um, in deferred compensation plans related to an employee not uh, maybe having their deductions taken right away. There was some language missing related to that. So it was a, this was a very robust review. Um, it went through uh, outside counsel, Lourdes Matthews, uh, myself, Valerie Weekly, um, and then back through council again, and then all, all of us were reviewing both the uh, resolutions and the BD1 that was written. So who's the outside council that was our review, our eyes, went before it came back again? Um, it's uh, Hans and Bridget. Okay, and um, so can you answer the question, do we have as much, is there certainty, Then this is passed, I'm gonna vote for it, because mm -hmm. uh, I honestly, it's. I'm not a 401k expert. Mm -hmm. However, saying that, I want to make sure, and I'm not a 401k participant here either, I want to make sure that those who are going to be enrolled in the program, that there are no mistakes that will come back to haunt them or us. I would say that, you know, these plans are reviewed by our outside expert counsel with the idea, with, with an eye towards not making mistakes and avoiding liability. Um, so that's that's the, the certainty we can provide. Okay. All right. Thank Whatever. you. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion, John? Sure, I'll make the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. There's a motion and a second, Madam Secretary. Director Chan? Yes. Director Coleman? Yes. Director Lenny? Yes. Director Patterson? Yes. Director Young? Yes. President Katz? Yes. Vice President McIntosh? Yes. All right. That moves us to determination and discussion. Yes. So um, as you're aware, our fees to our customers must reflect the cost of providing that service. Uh, to support the fees, we have to complete a cost of service study at least every 10 years. Um, the water system cost of service study was completed eight years ago, and the wastewater system was completed four years ago. As part of this study, um, we plan to conduct the cost of service study for both systems to bring the water rates and the wastewater charges in alignment. We have Phoebe Groh here, our principal management analyst, to provide some additional background before you consider this item for, your appro for approval. Thank you, Clifford, for the excellent introduction for this um, contract that we have before you guys today. And um, so we'll just, oops, am I on the right one? Okay. Okay. Down arrow. Okay. Okay. Um, so here we are, water and wastewater cost of service study. Um, so in this presentation, we'll go over what is a cost of service study. Um, as Clifford mentioned, it's been four years since we did the last one of these, which was wastewater, and um, eight years since we did the water cost of service study. Uh, we'll go over our scope for this upcoming cost of service study that we'll complete in 2025. Um, we'll talk some about those other cost of service studies that we've done previously. Um, and talk about the ways that we'll be asking for your input throughout this process. And finally, just our recommendation, which no surprise is please approve the contract. Okay, so what is a cost of service study? So it's a three-step process. The first two steps are largely a technical analysis um, for which we bring on board an expert consultant. And that's the way we've always done these over the years um, with outside help. Um, so first we look at our revenue requirements, essentially just how much, um, how much revenue do we need to bring in from rates uh, for both water and wastewater separately, of course. Uh, the second step, confusingly, is also called cost of service. Um, but this is where we look at the customer classes and what is the proportional cost of service attributed, attributable to each of those customer classes. For reference, our current customer classes are single-family residential, multifamily residential, and um, all other, which would comprise the industrial and commercial um, businesses. Um, additionally, we also have uh, non-potable or recycled water 
as a, um, a separate customer class. So when we get all through that technical analysis, then we get to the fun part, which is our rate design. Um, so there's policy decisions involved at that level, and we'll be coming back to this board for, for input on that. Um, and, we're, and there we're trying to match our rate design with our organization's goals and objectives. Um, and so mod modifying the rate structure, which currently, for example, on the water side, the rate structure is a uh, fixed uh, service charge based on meter size plus the volumetric rates, which are variable by customer class. And then we have the tiered rates within the single family customer class. Uh, so when we talk about rate design, we're talking about rate structure and we're talking about things like that. Uh, we are required to do these cost of service studies per California law at least every 10 years. It'll be almost 10 years when we get this one completed in 2025 for uh, water. We are electing to do the wastewater cost of service study at this time uh, because if we make any changes on the water side that might affect how we do wastewater billing, uh, it would be handy to um, keep them aligned that way. So for this upcoming cost of service study, uh, to be very specific, the rates that are involved are the ones that we often refer to as Prop 218 rates. Um, Prop 218, as you probably know, was a California ballot initiative that passed in 1996, and it added amendments to the California Constitution, which do govern how we do these studies. Um, so our Prop 218 rates on the water side are in Schedule A. So those are those um, serviced and or fixed charges plus the flow charge, um, including recycled water charges the, and the elevation surcharge are all under Schedule A. Schedule A is our drought surcharge. That is part of this study. And then on the wastewater side, wastewater Schedule A, those are the main treatment rates, our flow strength and service charges. And Schedule B, our wet weather facilities charge, which is a little different because it's on the property bill. Um, so in addition to that main scope of work, we um, as detailed in the BD1, we have an optional task to review our system capacity and wastewater capacity fees. Um, those, well, we'll look at that in just a second, but um, we just want to make sure that there's, um, that we're, any changes that we make under cost of service um, don't impact the way that we do SCC and wastewater capacity fees, and that we're um, implementing those consistent with current law. These have been mentioned previously. All these studies, uh, for reference, are on the East Bay Mud public website, ebmud.com slash rates. Uh, so the 2015 water and wastewater cost of service studies that Clifford mentioned, the 2019 wastewater cost of service study, and then um, you know, not the core subject of this project right now, but somewhat adjacent, uh, the Wastewater capacity fee study was done in 2019 alongside the wastewater cost of service study, and we did a 2021 um, system capacity charge or SCC study. And so those aren't, aren't the, core biz the core work here, but we'll be looking at those to make sure that our rate study and our, the way that we implement um, these capacity charges are aligned. So going forward, um, schedule for the project, and particularly schedule for, um, for input from the board. Uh, first up, we'll, have a, we'll be scheduling a cost of service workshop to focus on all this work. Um, a highlight of that workshop will be presenting the public participation plan that our consultant is scoped to prepare in this first um, couple months of the project. Uh, then we'll come back in October to um, go over the draft rate structure. This all has to happen fairly quickly because then by um, spring of 2025, we're reviewing the final rate structure as part of the um, regularly scheduled biennial budget workshop. And we're plugging into the usual rate and budget um, schedule there. In April of 2025, we'll need to do our Prop 218 noticing, which we'll have um, any rate increases, which are largely separate from this cost of service study. Those are more tied to the budget process. But then if we do make any changes to the rate structure, that'll also need to go into the Prop 218 notice. And then finally, of course, we have rate approval that we'll need to do in June of 25. 
So with that, um, our recommendation is um, please authorize the agreement with Stantec Consulting Services, partnered with um, or teamed with small businesses, CV strategies, and water resources economics for our water and wastewater cost of service study. And I'll move the item. Do you have a question? Sure. I'll second. The question is, um, you said that it go into effect in June of 2025, or when's uh, well, when's the July, board expected July to be? July 1, 2025. So the board will be voting on it at some point in the 2025 calendar. It would typically, it. so um, you know, you would have voted on the the rates that were effective July 1 of 2023. Um, okay. That we had the rate adoption hearing, I right. think. June 12th or 13th of 2023. So um, the whole thing happens again approximately two years okay. after that. Are there any other questions? Marguerite? Yeah. I, um, you know, I saved most of it for the, for the workshop, I think. But as you said, it's a very fast timeline. It's a very t fast timeline to change anything mm -hmm. and to consider what is changing in the world of cost of service. I know we're, you know, we're very conservatively bound by um, Prop 218, but there's, um, in, in other parts of the country, um, uh, you know, there are, there, there, there is research and evaluation and analysis, that, for instance, at UNC and some other places that are looking at, um, you know, and whether whether there are ways to look at costs that are different than what we've traditionally done, such as um, the value of or the cost savings of our customers that don't use very much water, and that that in fact is supply, and we don't we don't ascribe a dollar amount to that. Um, so I'm I'm just wondering whether there's um, you know, whether Stantec, I'm, I'm going to vote for the item, but whether Stantec can, can at least open the door to looking at, um, you know, some of these more innovative ways to look at uh, water use and, and the cost of water service delivery. Well, the idea with this cost of service study is for it to be quite a comprehensive study um, and agree that the timeline, you know, there's, there's only so much time before we have to get this in place. Um, but one of the reasons for selecting the Stantec team was um, they did have broad national experience, so it's nice to be able to get a, um, perspectives that aren't, aren't just California where um, we do things a certain way. And maybe, Phoebe, just um, as we lead up into the spring workshop, you know, can we provide some information, you know, well in advance for the board to look at? Because showing them all this information at the workshop is probably a bit much to ask for meaningful feedback. So um, we can maybe we can plan to do that too. Yeah, we can give some um, preparatory materials. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We have a motion by John, seconded by I believe it was Doug. Mm -hmm. uh, roll call, Madam Secretary. Director. Director Chan? Yes. Director Coleman? Yes. Director Linney? Yes. Director Patterson? Yes. Director Young? Yes. President Katz? Yes. Vice President McIntosh? Yes. That moves us on to item 15, the general manager's report. Yes. So um, this is the last board meeting of our centennial year. Um, so we'd like to share with you all the activities this past year that commemorate our 100th anniversary and also provide a status on some of the remaining projects. Um, I also want to take a moment and thank the many hundreds of employees and retirees who helped with all these efforts. Um, I also like to thank the board um, for participating in many of the activities, including the community celebration, the employee picnic, the time capsule event, uh, and the many water walks. Um, I also want to note that in the back of the room, we have some artifacts from uh, our East Bay Mud history and pre-East Bay Mud history, including the original vote that uh, formed East Bay Mud. Um, uh, but with that, I want to pass on to Tracy Morales our, in our Public Affairs Office, who led and managed uh, these activities and is here today to provide an update. Good afternoon, Board President Katz, uh, Vice President McIntosh, and members of the board. It's my pleasure to share with you the Centennial Campaign Update as we wrap up this year. 
Today, I'm gonna to share with you the vision and goals that drove our campaign, as well as the various communication strategies that we implemented, and provide you an impact analysis of our efforts, as well as provide you an overview of the, um, the next phase of our centennial campaign, which includes an update to our administration building's first floor lobby. As part of our centennial vision, we developed a vision that focused on honoring the past while focusing on our future, and that was truly developed by the guidance and principles provided by the board. You encouraged us to develop a campaign that was meaningful, cost-effective, and engaged our customers. And with that, we developed three goals, which was to relay the East Bay Med story in new ways, to create moments of connection with our community, as well as raise awareness of East Bay Med as a vital part of our community. So we told our story with a new look and a centennial logo, and we refreshed all of our communications materials. We partnered with the business community in the East Bay, and we released our first centennial logger that sold out across East Bay stores. And we also released this commemorative t-shirt Combined, these efforts raised over $16,000 for the Water Lifeline program, and it provided a vehicle for us to talk about the importance of water quality and reliable service. We also shared an advertising campaign on um, billboards and bus shelters, and it was focused on 100 years of, which was to tell the story of the moments that are brought together by water. And we also told this, uh, where we shared this advertising in Chinese and Spanish. And an additional tool that, we, that was news to public affairs was digital targeting, which allowed us to, tell, to get this advertising in front of more East Bay Mud customers. Now to bring our customers together, our community together, we hosted our 100th birthday party and community fair. And as you may recall, this was um, an incredible celebration. It was an opportunity to bring our community together. We planned for about 1,000 attendees and over 3,000 people attended. It was an opportunity to highlight the job opportunities at East Bay Mud, to talk about infrastructure investments, and hopefully inspire the next generation of water workers at East Bay Mud. And I do want to highlight um, uh, Max Pfeffer, associate civil engineer, who was a project manager on this event and added invaluable um, support for logistics. We added a whole new level of engagement through our water walks. This was an opportunity to provide a behind the scenes access to our facilities, our watershed, and even a cemetery tour. We engaged over 250 attendees, and we've also partnered with Holy H2O to conduct bio blitzes and identify uh, different species on our watersheds. To commemorate our centennial date on May 22nd, we, um, we held a time capsule event with the media. We invited our partners and our stakeholders. Through this time capsule, we were able to honor our past and look at our future. We um, incorporated in this time capsule a section of redwood pipe, as well as letters to future employees. And it was truly an opportunity to uh, commemorate this important date. We also released a documentary film it was a water lifeline for 100 years. And in this film, it was truly an opportunity to highlight our staff, our retirees, and uh, Director Patterson, who talks about the various career opportunities available at the district. We've had view parties across the district, and we've had an incredible amount of positive response. This video is now available on YouTube. Now I wanted to share with you a look at some of the impact measures that we've uh, generated since holding all of these different activities. I'd like to highlight the media um, value for all of our media work that was conducted this year. We generated over $100,000 in earned media coverage with an estimated reach of 33 million people. We also have other numbers, like the partnerships that we, um, we had with nonprofits in the community who partnered with us to hold the community fair. And it was 
truly just a moment of connection and an opportunity for us to see the impact that we're having with all of these various initiatives throughout the centennial. So I'll just uh, let you have a moment just to look at that. Now as we capture or we kind of um, cap off the centennial year, we'd also like to seize the momentum of all of the engagement, all of the work that we're doing with the community, and also provide an, uh, or also let you know about work that's happening to update our administration building lobby. Um, this is going to allow us to create a space that's welcoming, warmer, educational, and in informational. We've partnered with S2 Associates. They're an education exhibitor that is helping us with developing the, the space plan for the first floor. We're targeting a spring 2024 installation date. And in the blue oval is where you'll see most of the transformation happen. We're going to be updating the fountain area. We're going to add a, a touchscreen media kiosk. And we're also going to be adding a section of original McCollumney Aqueduct. We're, we're going to update the display cases that are existing, and at the back of the first floor, we're going to create a history section as well as transform the Water Smart Center. This is a look at the fountain space now, and then the proposed curved wall that will be behind the granite bench. This curved wall will contain information about um, the various district operations and will have lighted features, um, interactive monitors, and also um, have, provide different elements of interest for visitors. This is a look at the conceptual design of the fountain space. It will go from right to left, and it'll start with our water supply, move toward water treatment, operations and maintenance, and then end with wastewater treatment. You'll see uh, the media kiosk um, is located here, and it'll provide an opportunity for people to learn about different innovations within district operations. And then you'll see the different, um, the different monitors that will be playing video on loop of um, that related content, and we'll have uh, artifact boxes to provide more visual interest for people um, learning about these different um, pieces of content. Now, when I mentioned the McCollumney Aqueduct, this is it. This is McCollumney Aque Aqueduct number one. It's 65 inches in diameter. And here is a rendering of the, of the um, feature that's going to be located near the window. And on our right, we have a look at the Water Smart Center. This will be a ceiling to floor panels with highly visual graphics. We'll incorporate a monitor that will showcase information about different strategies and tools that East Bay Mud offers to conserve water. Now, as we look ahead for the AB Lobby uh, exhibit uh, debut um, and other uh, centennial-related projects, I just want to provide you an overview of what we'll be working on this fall and winter. We'll be focused on fabricating the exhibit Next week, we'll be debuting an art exhibit that will highlight our vintage truck posters from the 50s and 60s. We're going to be updating and, and, look, and building on the centennial communications materials that were developed this year to modernize and refresh our, our, our communications. And we're going to be evaluating the next phase of water walks to optimize this successful program. And then in spring 2024, we're going to be installing the exhibit, and we look forward to providing you a tour of this new lobby. And I um, would love to hear any questions. Any questions? Looks great. Um, I, one question about the, the curved front wall and the, and the bench. How are we making that accessible? That's, um, accessibility is an important discussion. We did want to have, um, we did want to have, we, di we didn't want to do any, we didn't want to do away with the bench because we know it provides important seating. Um, is there a specific? Um, oh, I'm just thinking that people, if it's a touch screen. So the monitors will not be, the monitors on the wall will not be. Um, oh, so the touch screen is at the, the kiosk at the, exactly. okay. Exactly. And so that, uh, will be at a height that 
people in chair uh, exactly uh, yes people in chairs our, or younger people or whatever can meet, meets ADA requirements yes our our consultant it takes those um, those requirements into consideration and is incorporating that into the design okay great I think it looks great um, what how much is the cost and is it in the budget I mean I know we approved it for the budget but I don't remember this item the estimated overall consultant cost for this project is two hundred and fifty-eight thousand dollars. For consultant, including cost, and material, fabrication, and installation. Okay, thank you. I would just like to lift Tracy up. Um, she made um, um, this presentation um, at the Aqua um, conference last week, and she was excellent. We were up for the was it Huell Hauser? award. We did not win. We should have. <laughs> uh, but I think the fix was in. Irvine Ranch won. And their general manager, the person, the staff person who was supposed to make their presentation, um, as Tracy did ours, um, was got sick that morning. So their general manager had to come and make the presentation. Um, and he actually said they spent some almost $800,000 on their campaign. I mean, it's just outrageous. Um, but I just want to lift you up. You did an excellent job, and you continue. You, you are great for East Bay Mud. Thank you. Thank you so much. I join in the remarks, uh, Madam Chair. I join in her remarks. You were excellent. Uh, we had a resounding time sitting there. We couldn't sit. We had to get up and move. <laughs> you guys were moving it. And uh, competitively speaking, for a lot less money, we gave a lot more meat. And like most things in Aqua, you know, I always have a, a burning hunch that some of those things are pre-planned. <laughs> with the Hauser Award and whatnot. And I, I want to just tell everybody, we really won. <laughs> in, in losing, we won. You know, you can <coughs> lose and win. And I, I'm saying we won because look at the heart of the people. Look at what we demonstrated all in <coughs> California. And people saw 100 years of progress. And it, it didn't cost a lot, but the whole staff joined in at different uh, uh, places uh, in sequence as we went forward. And we're still celebrating. So I, I enjoyed uh, being in the seat uh, where I could be back here, push you guys up there. You did all the work. You go out front, that's our district. That's the strength of the district. It comes from you. You make it happen. So all of my friends that I could uh, tell about it and let know really respect you. And they all say, you guys didn't charge us too much for the rates, you know? And, and they keep saying, don't be like Fiji and E. <laughs> I just wanted to put that in because I had a great time. I enjoyed it every moment. Yes. Keep Thank up you. the good work. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you. Clifford. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you to Max and, again, all the employees and retirees. Um, so for the last presentation, uh, just last month, we provide an update uh, to the Planning Committee on a number of East Bay habitat restoration projects in the Planning Committee asset. We share this um, really good news presentation with the full board. So we have Bert Mulcahy, our supervising fisheries and wildlife biologist, to provide the update. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I think most of you have a pretty good idea of the work East Bay, made, East Bay Mud does uh, to restore habitat on the Macomb River, but you probably have less of a good idea about the work that happens here for creek restoration in the East Bay. Uh, the East Bay Fisheries and Wildlife Division does a lot of restoration on our East Bay mud watershed. 
uh, including habitat improvements for rare plants, California red-legged frog, western pond turtle. Uh, but this presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on the creek restoration efforts and the partnerships we've formed to get these creek restorations done in the East Bay. So why creek restoration? Urbanization in the East Bay is, has caused habitat degradation in most of our local creeks to the point where they really don't support some of the sensitive species that they used to. Uh, our creeks have problems with invasive species, pollution, channel modification, but also barriers to fish migration like uh, the culvert shown on the right here on San Pablo Creek. As these creek habitats become more degraded, our protected lands such as East Bay Mud's watershed provide important habitat for local sensitive species. And the creek restoration efforts that we support tend to seek improvements to habitat conditions in the local creeks but also improve access for these species to our watershed where the best habitat exists. Restoration aligns with East Bay Mud's stewardship goals on the watershed and also with the East Bay Mud mission statement. Over the years, we've formed partnerships with many local agencies and creek groups to do smaller scale projects. Uh, we've completed creek restorations, native plant gardens, creek monitoring and trash cleanups. Uh, in fact, right now, the Friends of Pinole Creek are finishing up a native pollinator garden, garden on our Pinole Valley watershed. The idea here is to improve habitat for monarch butterflies on our watershed. Uh, we've worked with groups locally, such as Friends of Pinole Creek, Spawners, the Friends of Rinda Creeks, and San Leandro Creek, to, just to name a few. On a larger scale, We've collaborated in the past on projects such as the Pinole Creek I-80 Fish Passage Project. Pinole Creek has a population of steelhead that are part of uh, the Central California Coast steelhead population, and this population is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. These fish, as adults, they live in the ocean. They ascend the local creeks to spawn, and their young rear in our local creeks. Uh, back in the 1990s, some of our East Bay mud biologists were among the first to notice that these culverts here at I-80 were a problem for fish getting upstream to our watershed. If you look on the map on the right, you can see I-80 is very far down near the bay in the lower third of the watershed, whereas we're trying to get them up to the middle of that map to the Pinole Creek watershed up higher. So in 2016, finally, after a lot of work, uh, the Contra Costa Resource Conservation District uh, was able to get the last bit of financing and grant money to complete a fish passage project at this site. East Bay Mud supported them all along with various um, duties, including uh, we did monitoring for the project, we, we helped them get grant funding, and we also completed the fish relocation at the project site before construction began. So these fish had to be removed before they could start construction, and um, we provided that because we had permits to handle these fish species already. On, on the left here, you can see the finished project at the lower end of the culverts. They basically created a, a concrete wall and a concrete curb to back water up into the culvert. The idea was to get uh, deeper water so that fish could swim up through the lower end of the culvert. And on the right, um, the upper culvert was a higher gradient, so they had to actually um, cut a notch in the culvert and create a fish ladder to get them over the top part of the culvert. East Bay Mud also provided five years of monitoring upstream on our watershed um, to demonstrate that fish such as steelhead were getting upstream to spawn, and, and in four of the five years we monitored, we had uh, Steelhead, I'm sorry, steelhead spawning upstream. About three miles upstream on Pinole Creek was the Alhambra Valley Road culvert. This was a culvert owned by the county uh, that failed rather, rather spectacularly in January of 2017 under high flows. Uh, the county had plans to re replace this culvert in kind. East Bay mud biologists, along with uh, biologists from the regulatory agencies, 
made the point that you know a bridge project here would be much more beneficial for fish passage issues in the creek. On the right, you can see the concrete abutments going in for this project. Again, East Bay Mud biologists provided in-kind services, including endangered species monitoring, and we did uh, fish relocation from this site as well before construction. We moved those fish upstream onto our watershed where there was good quality habitat. And on the left here, you can see the finished product under the bridge. The creek's in a much more natural state, um, allowing fish to swim up through and onto our watershed. Uh, the county was actually so happy with this project at the end that they actually bought some, you can see a little bit in this photo, along the walls they put some fish placards up, some salmon placards to comm commemorate the project. And since this project was completed, we've seen um, fish spawning upstream on our watershed annually. Did East Bay Mud provide the painting inside of the... <laughs> Those in-kind contributions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of them have been vandalized <laughs> uh, over the years, but there's still a few left. So um, the Two Dog Fish Passage project is, is actually an East Bay Mud project <coughs> um, on Kaiser Creek, which is an east tributary to Upper San Leandro Reservoir. On this map, you can see there's a little call out for the, the two dog location on Kaiser Creek. So Kaiser Creek has a landlocked population of steelhead. Um, originally, these steelhead were anadromous, the term meaning you know fish that go from the ocean to freshwater to spawn. Uh, since 1927, the, when the dam was built, these fish got isolated inside the reservoir, and they're now patadromous, or what we call an ad fluvial population, meaning they complete their entire migration in fresh water. So they live as adults in the reservoir as they would in the ocean, and then they ascend these local tributaries to spawn, and that's where their young rear in Kaiser Creek, San Leandro Creek, Redwood Creek. On the left here is a photo of, of a male spawned out that we found on Kaiser Creek, very close to the Two Dog Project site in 2010 just to give you an idea what these fish look like, they're beautiful. And East Bay mud biologists wanted to find a way to improve fish passage at this culvert, uh, knowing that it was an impediment for fish getting upstream. So in 2022, we came in, removed the culvert, and installed a fish-friendly channel uh, in the creek. And then in 2023, came back, uh, poured the concrete abutments, and installed a bridge. The, the new channel is successful. Even before we finished this project last winter, we saw fish upstream, and uh, including Sacramento suckers, we hadn't seen upstream of this site in a few decades of monitoring. The project is also interesting because <clears throat> it's a uh, project that was mostly completed from planning through construction by district forces. Over 50 employees from 14 different divisions or divisions, divisions at East Bay Mud worked on this project. And ultimately, it's a great example of um, these divisions collaborating to push a good project over the finish line and at a reduced cost. There's also the Tomato Stand Fish Passage Project. This is a proposed project. Um, this is a culvert um, at a location called the Tomato Stand on our Pinole Valley watershed. Uh, this culvert is perched and is an impediment to fish migration upstream. Uh, we're currently uh, trying to get funding to address uh, this particular culvert. The hope is that we can replace this culvert with a full channel spanning bridge and a fish friendly channel like we just showed you on the last slide for Two Dog. Uh, hopefully our, our grant application is successful because this is the last man-made structure that's an impediment to fish passage on Pinole Creek. Once this is taken care of, those fish would have free reign to get all the way to the top of our uh, Pinole Valley watershed. So in conclusion, some key takeaways. These creek restoration projects engage the public, improve degraded habitat in our local creeks. Um, these types of collaborations with local agencies and the public 
are key for East Bay Mud meeting its stewardship goals. Yeah. East Bay Mud's East Bay Mud watershed in the, uh, provides critical high quality habitat for sensitive species, um, particularly in a, an environment where most creek habitats are, are becoming degraded. Our watershed's an important place for them to thrive. And in the future, we plan to pursue more grant funding for these types of habitat restoration projects, such as uh, the tomato stand culvert that I just showed you on the last slide. With that, I'll take any questions you might have. We really enjoyed this presentation uh, and planning. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for doing it for the full board as well. Any questions? John? First, kudos on the effort mm -hmm. that uh, you are undertaking and that whole division is undertaking. I think it's a perfect standout about what a water agency should be doing to protect its environment for today and for the future. Um, I was wondering when you were talking, beginning the slide deck, you don't need to go back about bringing partners in to help. Have you ever reached out to local schools to help on the watershed for whether it be tree planting, litter removal, things like that? A lot of schools from sixth grade on have environmental programs where they may never step on a watershed. And this would be a good opportunity to introduce them to what a watershed is and what we're doing, which then they'll tell other people about. Yes, we had to obviously condense uh, the slide at the beginning, but I think um, those types of interactions are happening particularly for our watershed and recreation group, the rangers. So they bring them out for those restorations and they uh, collaborate with us on ideas about areas that could use restoration and what type, type of plantings they could use. And ultimately, uh, it's a good source of labor and also gets the public well involved. A lot of these projects as well, um, uh, the Fisheries and Wildlife Division is, as well as Watershed and Recreation, we sponsor some of these events and get the public out to improve these uh, creek conditions, including trash cleanups and, and any of these other events that, that help engage the public. Yeah. Kudos to the whole effort of the team that's working on that. It's well deserved. You're doing a heck of a job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh. one, one thing I wanted to say, because I'm home a lot, I watch a lot of programs. And right now, they're hungry for this kind of information. And we're, we came at the right time. This is not a finishing of anything, but the beginning of everything. And I'm saying, you fit right into the mode now and you've got the quality to move in there and continue to expand. Uh, our conservation and programs uh, for the fisheries and whatnot, the return, the, how great it was, you see? And, and those are the stories that they're picking up all over the place. So you can sparkle. There's some water agencies that got on there. I don't know how they got on there because they don't have half the stuff we got. So <laughs> I just want to say keep plugging. You're doing a great job. Thank you. It is, it's tough. You got to keep going. There's a lot of work to do. Yep. So we haven't it. found any giant uh, goldfish, have we? Uh, they, <laughs> believe, it or, believe it or not, they exist in. It in, was on the news this morning. Yeah, they Lake exist. Erie. In, <laughs> they actually exist in several of our reservoirs. The biggest goldfish are probably in Lafayette and San Pablo. We get goldfish sometimes. Uh, alligators, in very large. So. Um, so yeah, we do have actually. Oak story. Years and years ago. Invasive goldfish in some of our reservoirs. They don't tend to cause too much problem. Yeah. They say they're in, just in the insidious and and. They should be they're taking over the ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. At least that's what they said this morning. It depends on the, the habitat that exists. In our area, they haven't maybe probably taken over as much because of the habitat characteristics. Okay. But it's pretty amazing to see a goldfish this big yeah. out of the reservoir. I mean, they showed them, I mean, 20, 30 of them, just that big. The um, last like goldfish. Yeah. <laughs> At, at the Great Lakes, there was a story recently in the paper. Yeah. And they're much larger than that. Mm -hmm. And they, they eat everything. They go out to deep water and come in when, and, and they, eat, they even eat uh, the grass. <laughs> they, they, 
they'll devour of everything. And other fish don't eat them because they swell up too big, <laughs> nothing to fit the mouth. <laughs> We have a lot of invasive fish species, unfortunately. Um, you mentioned that, um, which is amazing, that, that this, if we get this tomato stand um, culvert replaced, that it'll be the last um, impediment to fish passage in Pinole Creek, which is huge. Mm -hmm. um, what's the story for, upper, for the San Leandro, Upper San Leandro tributaries? Yeah, so the, the story in Pinole is pretty amazing. Um, I just should mention that for some weird reason, as Pinole developed, uh, there are eight bridges downstream. Almost in almost no place I've seen locally is that the case. It's usually culverts, and they usually cause fish passage problems. So right. we're kind of fortunate at the beginning that really that I-80 culvert was, was one of the main issues to deal with. And unfortunately, virtually none of our other watersheds are as lucky. Um, we have... Uh, San Leandro Creek, we do have fish that, that um, survive and spawn below uh, Chabot Dam. And so that is another one that doesn't really have any major impediments uh, below Chabot, but they can't really get above Chabot. And that's where we have that adfluvial population above Upper right. San Leandro Reservoir. But are there, in terms of the tributaries into Upper San Leandro, are there other culverts that impede that local population from... There are a few, but in the most cases, um, they're able to get upstream. Uh, sometimes some of those um, impediments are only temporary and they're able to get upstream. And so we keep an eye on it. We monitor spawning annually under our habitat conservation plan, to make sure that they're getting upstream and there's no large woody debris dams or any culverts or anything that are preventing fish passage. And so whenever an agency replaces a culvert nowadays, you have to address fish passage if there's if it's a fish bearing stream. So luckily, you know, no one's <clears> probably <throat> going to go in there and change something and not address fish passage. Okay, thank you. Good work. Okay. okay. Well, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering which organizations you're working with uh, around San Leandro Creek. Uh, the Friends of San Leandro Creek. They currently are um, creating a um, native plant garden at Chabot Park. They want to create a, a small uh, native plant garden there like many of the other creek groups have done. Um, mo they're probably the most active mm -hmm. in that watershed. We deal with a lot of other creek groups, Friends, friends of Five Creeks, Friends of Sausal Creek that aren't mm -hmm. necessarily on our, our reservoir watersheds, but right. we, we work with them where we can. Um, but Friends of San Leandro Creek is the main one. Okay. If you ever need something from Ward 7, let me know. Okay. Thank you. Quick question. Do we have problems with beavers in the fish flow? I know there's been an issue in Martinez. Beavers are great. They're coming back. They're helping. And, but it's been an issue in the city of Martinez with beavers and the fish population migrating. No, we haven't had any issues in, in our local creeks. And luckily, we have a lot of information about our local creeks because uh, we're out there collecting that information. Most okay. places really don't have that much information, mm -hmm. so I don't think it's a problem at this point. And last thing, are we reaching out to the Native Americans who used to inhabit the, that region where we're doing the work to bring them in and, and into the project and, and work? Yeah, we definitely have plans to discuss that. Um, we're, we'll probably be doing some tours of our, our fish passage projects so they can come see Great. some of the work we've done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Bert. Um, thank you. And attached is the monthly report at your places, the Speakers Bureau. Um, and if there are no questions, I want to wish all of you a happy holiday and a happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, committee reports, planning. Uh, planning this morning, we heard two reports, one on recycled water feasibility, uh, went through a number of different options uh, for that. Uh, we'll get some additional information as those um, studies are completed. And then we also heard a very interesting report on employee housing feasibility study. Uh, we're looking into using 
uh, district lands to lease to a developer who might be able to pro or who would provide uh, affordable housing for our employees uh, within uh, a short distance or a relatively short distance to district facilities uh, and uh, basically gave the go-ahead to take a look at that uh, and uh, provide more information as uh, they discover it. All right. Thank you, Doug. Um, our Legislative Human Resources Committee met this morning. We had an update on diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as contract equity program. Uh, we did move the employee feedback um, item to the general board meeting this afternoon, and we all heard that today. That concludes my report. Please submit other items for future consideration to the general manager. And before other directors comment, I'd like to say uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year to everyone. Director comments. Uh, it's been what a year. It's been. Glad it's coming to a close. <laughs> and like Lisa said, <coughs> happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, since we're still in the middle of Hanukkah and Christmas and to everybody else has beliefs that may be different. Um, 2024 be less exciting and better. <laughs> May all your holidays be bright. <laughs> Short and sweet, Bill. I love it. Christmas. Let it be joyous. He's not done. Joyous. <laughs> Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> um, I just want to echo that and I want well, thank everyone for their work and this is my first year wow so <laughs> um, but you know it's always thrilling for me when um, people who talk about our water and so at Thanksgiving dinner I was in Central Valley and there was a, a stranger that I sat next to and heard that I was with East Bay Mud and he got and I was like, oh, East Bay Mud, I love East Bay Mud water. I've taken, uh, I take your water to Florida, to New Mexico, to Texas. <laughs> um, but he was uh, as, as enthusiastic as we are here. Here, He was more enthusiastic. And, and just to say that uh, the work we do here is important. So thank you. And happy holidays. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are adjourned. <laughs>